Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another Mad Meta Magic, I think. Yes, Mad Meta Magic. Welcome back to another Mad Meta Magic, everybody. And uh, today we'll be playing uh, the patron requested list of. I'm going to call this Orzov Blink. It didn't really have a name. Um, but this is from Francis Boyes, or I, once again, still don't know how to pronounce that person's name. And I apologize, uh, they have not clarified to me, so I'm going to assume that I did so correctly until otherwise told. But uh, they found this list, they really wanted me to play it, and I was holding off um, from the beginning of the month because I didn't have the griefs or solitudes. I ended up doing like 17 more Modern Horizons drafts, I never got any. Um since we initially talked about it, and I needed them for other decks, so I figured, you know what, why not, we'll get them, they're probably not getting banned, because they were just printed, they're super high power level, and we're going to need them to be competitive anyway. Um, so I now have Griefs and Solitudes, um, not because they were requested, because I don't tend to buy decks, or buy cards for decks that are requested, unless they are cards I am already uh, considering purchasing. Um, if it's a deck that I don't have a ton of interest in playing and it gets requested if somebody is willing to buy me the cards to play it then sure you know i'll then i will play the deck i have no problem doing that but um it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis of whether or not i'm going to do that so if you request it uh from me either through a deck redemption or you pay for uh me to play a deck um if i don't have the cards i don't have the cards uh and i'm not going to buy the cards unless i was already kind of intending on doing so and i'm Evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis. But anyway, that's enough of that. Uh, we've got a pretty interesting deck here today. Um, basically, the idea is we are going to... The primary combo of this deck is playing Grief on turn one and then either immediately ephemerating Undying Evil or Malakir rebirthing it to Thought Seize our opponent, have it sacrifice itself to its Evoke, and then uh, flicker it so it comes back into play, thought sees our opponent again, and then we start with a 3-2 with Menace. Um, and if it's ephemerated, we can ephemerate it again on our next upkeep to thought sees them again, um, which is an incredibly, incredibly powerful uh, opener. With um, Prismatic Ending being the primary removal spell of choice, it being sorcery speed, and um, I've not seen a lot of Lightning Bolt. I've seen a little bit of Path, and uh with i mean there's some people still playing push and stuff like that push does hit grief but only in some uh minimum circumstances uh grief basically has to be answered in response to a flicker effect or an undying evil or a malakir rebirth and depending on the timing of the priority if you uh, if if your opponent suspects like that you're gonna flicker or something like that uh you might be able to fire a second one off and then it just, it, things get insane. But the thing about this interaction is you're giving up two cards and a third card to flicker uh, to take up to three cards from your opponent, probably two. And if your opponent uses a removal spell on grief that actually kills grief in response to the first flicker effect, you still get a thought seize and you traded three cards for two. Um, so it's like, it, it can be a negative interaction, but the thing is, we are going to recover from that immediate, like, dump of resources on turn zero faster than our opponent is. And the reason that we're going to is we have things like Charming Prince, which can scry, it can slow flicker, multiple of them can slow flicker each other to flicker our uh, creatures at different timings. Uh, we have Stoneforge Mystic, which we can use to get Batter Skull, Cauldra, Sword of Fire and Ice. Uh, it's just an incredibly powerful thing. Not to mention you can flicker Stoneforge. There's a bunch of really interesting tricks you can do with Stoneforge that involve cheating Batter Skulls in and out of play. Um, it's very powerful when you triple thought sees your opponent on turn one. This is like, how do they answer that on turn two? Um, if Grief does get answered on turn one, we can always persist it on turn two. Uh, to just get it back and then flicker it some more. We can persist Stoneforge Mystic, so the reanimation spell here is powerful and high synergy. Um, Dam is our removal spell of choice because we are Orzhov, so we can play it for double black to just remove uh, a problematic creature, or we can overload it for double white and two colorless to wrath if we need to wrath. Um, we can flicker our own guys with Dam and an Undying Evil, 
uh, which is kind of, you know, a little odd, but it does work. Uh, we also have Maul of the Skyclaves in the equipment package. Beyond Sword of Fire and Ice, Batter Skull and Cauldre Complete. It's just, uh, if we're going to be flickering, it's good to have a fourth target for your Stone Forge rather than just the usual three. In the three drop slot, we have Skyclave Apparition, which is a amazing removal spell. It does get some flicker value. If you exile a zero drop, they don't get a token. But um, be aware that, of course, flickering does give your opponent a token of some kind. We have Callous Blood Mage, which is kind of interesting in this deck. It uh, does a lot of different things. It can draw us cards, it can make blockers, it can exile your opponent's grave. Um, it's kind of just like an all-around value card, and, and it's not bad in this deck. We have a Singleton Kaya's Guile, because the card is really good. Um, sometimes it's difficult to cast this in multiples. It's definitely difficult to entwine this card, especially in a deck like this one, for a reason that I'm about to explain. Um, so we're only playing one. Uh, we'll probably never get maximum value off this, but it is a very, very good and very versatile spell, and we're playing Orzov, of course. Uh, so I've explained the equipment. The other elemental that we can flicker is Solitude, and Solitude is going to be very important versus decks like Blitz and Burn and um, things like that. So Solitude, Swords to Plowshares, when it enters, Evoke is the Exile, a white card from your hand. It does have Flash, so you can do it on your opponent's turn. It does have Lifelink, so versus an aggressive deck, it can help buy you back into the game. Um... Gaining our opponent a ton of life really, in general, doesn't matter if we eliminate all of their threats. If we just, like, flicker this two times and then our opponent has nothing. Uh, even if they gain, like, nine life, it, it doesn't matter because then we're going to keep their hand empty with grief and just beat them down. Um, a very powerful interaction, especially for decks that want to do something big on turn one. It's very good versus things like hammer times. very good versus things that want to go tall on a single creature. Um, it's good versus burn because it has lifelink. And basically, us trading two or three cards to take, you know, between two and four of their cards, uh, when burn already has to, like, is very, very measured on how many resources it spends to try and kill you, something like Solitude or Grief, jumping in there, mi mixing all that up, it's very difficult for burn to come back from. Um, so we have a very odd mana base, and uh, flickering is not free. But we are running a lot of the Bolt Lands. We have a Maria's Call and we have Agadim's Awakening. Because these are effectively lands that have colors. And that is important for uh, casting Grief or Solitude for their Evoke costs. Uh, we have a Maria's Call and Agadim's Awakening because they are the untapped lands. They can, in some late game circumstances, actually win us the game by casting them as a spell, so they're not actually totally dead. It is unlikely that that is the case, but it is possible to get there. Uh, we have Silent Clearing. Uh, we can sack it to draw cards. This is kind of an anti-synergy with casting things like a Maria's Call, but generally we're going to be doing those things in different kinds of games. So uh, we also have Malakir Rebirth because it is a second undying evil. It does cause us to lose life, but it is also a land. Uh, it can be pitched to grief because it is black. Uh, it synergizes with grief. Uh, it's probably, probably the best card in the deck besides Ephemerate uh, to combo with grief. Um, just because of its high synergy. We have a single eye, uh, hive of the Eye Tyrant, which is mainly just a, a man land. It's an untapped black source on turn one or two. Um, it does help kind of cut down on the life cost of the deck. Uh, and I think that's everything I need to talk about in the main deck. Uh, it's kind of a long deck tech. I apologize, especially after my uh, unrelated discussion that was happening. Um, so... Out of the sideboard, we have Dranith Magistrate. This card is good versus the Cascade decks. This card is good versus uh, a bunch of other decks that are casting spells in weird ways. It stops them from casting anywhere other than their hand. That does not That does mean they can cast spells for free, because uh, they can you know, evoke a grief, or they can force a negation us, or something like that. But they will not be able to cast spells from their library, or exile, or the grave. And Dranith Magistrate... It's just good at uh, stopping that from happening. If we come up against an affinity deck or a deck that's playing an, an inordinate amount of artifacts, we can play Kataki, War's Wage. Kataki is less punishing versus us with the Stoneforge package because odds are we'll just have to pay one or two mana to keep the things we want to keep around, uh, whereas our opponent will have to pay one for nearly every permanent. Uh, it's very good versus the food deck if we come across it. Stony Silence is a little bit worse for us. However, 
Uh, Stony Silence really only interacts with Batter Skull and Sword of Fire and Ice unfavorably. Batter Skull, Cauldra, and Maul all have Enter the Battlefield effects that can trigger even though we have Stony Silence. We just can't re-equip those equipment. So I imagine when we're bringing in Stony Silence, we're taking out the Sword of Fire and Ice and something else. Uh, I don't think that means that we need to take out the Stoneforge package, because that's obviously how we're going to pressure our opponent to win the game most games. We have Leyline of the Void as our Grave Hate of Choice to complement Kaya's Guile, Callus Blood Mage, and to a lesser extent, Dranith Magistrate. Fracture is a card that we can pitch to either Grief or Solitude, but it also can hit Enchantments, Artifacts, or Planeswalkers. It's just the best uh, disenchant effect that exists if you're playing Orzov. We have Chalice of the Void, which is a zero-drop artifact. This is something that we can bring in versus Cascade decks, or decks otherwise playing a bunch of zero-drops. It can matter a lot. Um, it's very bad against Prismatic Ending, and versus us, it, we really wouldn't ever want to set this on one, because it would completely disrupt the entire combo that we have going on. Although I could see it happening versus Burn, like if we get the combo off of like Grief Ephemerate on turn one, then play Chalice on one on turn two, depending on what else is in our hand, just to shut off all of the one drops that Burn plays otherwise, I could see that happening and being reasonable. Um, but the important thing is this answers zero drops on turn one. Like, you can play this, and then your opponent can't cast no-cost spells and such. Um, even though it interacts unfavorably with Prismatic Ending, it's really easy for Prismatic Ending to answer. Uh, even if this is set to one, because they can just scale the X cost on Prismatic Ending, uh, it still deserves a slot here, because we are trying to do several things on turn zero one. Um, and then, of course, we have Sword of Truth and Justice, which, if we decide we need protection from white, maybe our opponent happens to be playing Path and not Prismatic Ending, we can bring in Sword of Truth and Justice, we can equip it to our guy. Um, this uh, also increases the size of our creatures as we proliferate and put 1-1 counters on stuff. Uh, that could matter versus burn when we play Solitude. If it has Life Link, that way they can't Path it, we can get it large enough that a single bolt won't kill it, etc. Um... And yeah, I think that's everything I need to talk about. I am 12 minutes into this recording already, and I have not started the game yet, but there was a lot to discuss, so I'll see you guys in round one. All right, we will be on the draw for round one. I also apologize if my hair seems like it's a mess. It's been doing its own thing ever ever since I went camping. Um, it's just, like, all over the place. I can't, like, tried wetting it down. Nothing happened. <laughs> uh, okay, so this hand is actually almost insanely good. On the draw, it might be, depending on how our opponent starts and if we draw a black card or not. Let's see if our opponent mulliganed. Uh, they're choosing to begin with seven seven cards in hand. I'm going to keep. If they lead on Thoughtseize, we're going to feel bad. All right, opponent leads on Chancellor of the Forge. This tells me that Grief is going to be very good against them because odds are they're playing uh, the Glimpse Cascade deck or something similar. All right, a second Undying Evil. Play Concealed Courtyard. Let's evoke Exiling Undying Evil. So we get to Thoughtseize first. Wave Sifter, Wave Sifter, Dark Dweller, Shardless Agent, Chancellor of the Forge. Okay, I'm going to take Shardless Agent. Then I'm going to Undying Evil. Okay. We sack the Grief. It comes back bigger. And we'll take a Wave Sifter. And that should pretty well cripple what our opponent is doing. Um, they can play a Gemstone Caverns. They don't even have the ability to evoke a Wave Sifter unless they got a green or a blue. They fetch and shock a Steam Vents, they drew Misty Rainforest, okay. They fetch and shock a Stomping Ground, and they are going to evoke Wave Sifter. Okay. They do not attack, we untap, we draw Agadim's Awakening. So I'm going to play this as a tap land, because it is unlikely I will need it to pitch at this point. Go to combat, attack for four. Um, I kind of want to play Skyclave Apparition, although playing Sword of Fire and Ice definitely accelerates our win. We just have to hope our opponent doesn't draw a Cascade spell at this point. Um, I could try to disrupt uh, a potential Cascade by playing Skyclave Apparition, taking out a clue, but my opponent has the ability to um, just sack the clue in response. And we drew Solitude, which is actually quite nice. Um, so I'm going to go to combat. We'll attack for four. I don't think my opponent plays any black spells, but uh, I lose nothing by not playing Urborg this turn. So just play Urborg, play Sword, leave up Solitude, and Skyclave Apparition, pass the turn. Opponent's probably going to cycle a clue here to try and find a Cascader. Opponent untaps and draws. Sacks a clue to draw. And I think that means we've got him. Yep. 
Fantastic. So opponent is playing the uh, elemental cascade deck, which means I am going to actually look up a deck list. I know Doomwake is a prolific content creator. I have no idea what they play um, regularly. I, I haven't watched them or anything like that. So out of the sideboard for us, uh, they would play Endurance as a way to exile the grave in response to perhaps a flicker or an undying evil. That is something we need to be aware of. Uh, they prop, they might bring in Foundation Breaker. Uh, I could see like Chalice of the Void putting it on one versus us. Um, I don't see anything I'm really concerned about. Uh, some lists play Force Negation or Teferi out of the side. Um, but I, as long, I mean, as long as they're not playing Leyline, I think we're fine. Uh, I'm going to bring in Chalice of the Void versus the Cascade, simply because I want to be able to put it on zero. Uh, Dranith Magistrate probably is a fair bring in. Uh, don't think we need Leyline of the Void. It's possible that we do, um, because they do have Goblin Dark Dwellers. I just don't know what I'm taking out for Leyline of the Void, perhaps. Maybe I could see, like, slotting out Callus Blood Mage, Skyclave Apparition for, like, Leyline, Dranith, Magistrate. I still need to cut three cards to get to where we're going. Um, I don't think I'm playing Kataki. I don't think I'm playing Stony Silence. Uh, they really just have artifact tokens for, like, basically like a threshold count. Um, let's see. I have a minute left, and I need to try and cut three cards here. Solitude feels less important in this matchup. I don't really need Kaya's Guile either. I'm going to cut Kaya's Guile, a Solitude, and I think possibly the Sword of Fire and Ice. And we'll try it like this. We really are more of like a flicker combo deck than we are any sort of stone blade. Even though we have Stoneforge Mystic and we have good equipment to get up off of it, it's really, we're really more of a combo deck than anything else, I think. Um, so Dranith Magistrate, we lose to a single removal spell if we play that. I think I'm going to mulligan. Uh, this has a ley line and we have an Undying Evil, but no... No grief synergy. Okay, I think I will keep this. I need to put two cards back. Maul of the Skyclaves is the first obvious one, and I think it needs to be Ephemerate. Um, the other cards in my hand are kind of nice. Um, Leyline just makes uh, like Goblin Dark Dwellers um, really bad. Okay, we drew an Ephemerate, which is fine. Play Concealed Courtyard past the turn. Opponent plays a Scalding Tarn, attacks us for one. We take one and go to 18. Untap. We draw Solitude. Solitude's also kind of important. Play Dranith Magistrate. Let's uh, lock down that Cascade as quickly as we can. Uh, Dranith Magistrate also does not die to Fire and Ice, but it can be bounced if my opponent's playing Brazen Borrower. Um, opponent cracks Scalding Tarn, which goes to the Exile Zone. For a Breeding Pool tapped. Okay, Dranith Magistrate resolves. Pass the turn. Opponent plays a Gemstone Caverns into a Tireless Provisioner. Um, that definitely has to go, but I think we can wait until our turn, because if we draw a white spell we don't want, um, we can Solitude and then Ephemerate and just take out their guys. I'm giving up Stoneforge Mystic for that, but I think it's less likely my opponent has a spell that kills Solitude versus a spell that would kill Stoneforge before Stoneforge becomes useful. The alternative is I can play out Stoneforge Mystic, get Cauldra, and then uh, leave up Ephemerate, which could protect Dranith Magistrate from removal. I think I'm going to go with the Stoneforge Mystic play, because worst case scenario, I can still pitch uh, Ephemerate to Solitude. Let's go get Cauldra. Pass the turn. So really, it seems like the only thing we would lose to right now is a double removal spell. It's like if they if they tried to kill Stoneforge Mystic, I think I might try to protect it with Ephemerate, because otherwise Cauldra is not really going to do anything. Um, and if they had a second removal spell at that point to kill Dranith Magistrate, then we would be in trouble. Okay, opponent plays a Seasoned Pyromancer. They discard Dark Dwellers and a Shardless Agent. They could also just try and beat us fairly. That is absolutely a thing they can do. They attack us for three, no blocks. All right, so we untap. We draw another Solitude. 
Okay. Um, let's just put in Cauldra. Living weapon. Go to combat. And attack for five. Hit them to 13. Pass the turn. Okay, opponent plays an Omnath. I am going to Solitude evoke Exile Solitude because I want to stop them in response to the Enter the Battlefield effect. I don't want them getting life and or getting yeah life and mana effectively. Um, and I am going to Ephemerate here. If they have removal for Dranith Magistrate, that would be really bad. But we're also going to take out Tireless Provisioner. So it was a very expensive cantrip for them. When Ephemerate comes off Suspend, um, we're going to Ephemerate Stoneforge Mystic. I don't think there's any put equipment into play shenanigans we can do based on timing here. Because there's no way to get uh, Stoneforge Mystic's activation under the Ephemerate copy. I could Flicker Solitude again, but we'll Flicker Stoneforge Mystic. Uh, let's go and get Maul of the Skyclaves. We draw another Stoneforge. So play the Maul. Suit up Solitude. I do want to gain some life. If my opponent has to play fairly, then... We might as well gain some life to try and put ourselves out of reach. Hit our opponent for 10. Go up to 17. Pass the turn. Opponent could still have um, removal for the Magistrate and Cascade and go off, but without Dark Dwellers it does make it much more difficult. They have a Tireless Provisioner. They play a Colony Garden, which gives them a treasure. I doubt they would need food for any reason. Oh, they put a food into play. Alright. So food potentially buys them one turn, um, unless they can make a whole bunch of it, which I guess is still possible. We get a Malakir Rebirth, so go to combat. Attack for 10. Opponent cracks Wooded Foothills. Uh, for a forest, they make a food. Okay. So they sack a food, gain life, go up to 12. Say no blocks, go down to 2. We'll play another Stoneforge Mystic. And tutor up Batter Skull. Pass the turn. We're going to leave up Malachi Rebirth. Um, if we had an untapped land there, it might have been worth playing it. Because then we could put Batter Skull into play to block, but... Uh, Malakir Rebirth here. Even if they do find removal for Dranith Magistrate, we can just protect it from a single removal spell that doesn't exile. Or doesn't bounce, of course. Alright, we took down Elemental Cascade. Uh, I think that we are, in general, pretty well positioned to deal with that deck. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy with that result. I'll see you guys in round two. Alright, um, the sand is almost good, but we can definitely do better uh, for round two here. No lands of any kind, uh, unfortunately, will not work. Otherwise, this hand would be great. If we had a black or a white land of any kind, it would be fantastic. I'm checking to see if my opponent mulligans here. I'm sure that some of the people who watch me are going to be like, Hey, Kano, uh, what about all that I hate free effects uh, nonsense that you kept saying? Like, why are you playing a deck that is based around abusing free effects? Uh, well, the short answer is because it's really good. The longer answer than that is because, um, you know what, I'm actually going to go to four. All right, um, we're going to put back Grief, Amarius Call, and I guess we have to put back Solitude. Uh, so our opponent's going to think that we're just some kind of Stone Blade deck. Opponent leads on Gemstone Caverns, Exiling, is this another, this is another Elemental Cascade deck? Brazen Borrower. Looks to be that way. It's probably Footfalls, though. Uh, play Concealed Courtyard Pass, but, you know. Kano, why are you playing a deck that abuses free effects if you hate them so much? Because the only recourse for me as a player when I think a card should be banned and Wizards of the Coast refuses to ban the card is for me to become part of the problem. That is the only choice of action that I have to get the desired result that I want. Which is, I would prefer that these cards have never existed in the first place, but I'd also rather them be banned than to continue to exist. Um because I just think that the play patterns they create are unfun. So my opponent is going to ice our only land here. Okay. We draw Silent Clearing, play Concealed Courtyard, pass the turn. Uh, it is unlikely that Stoneforge Mystic and or a single Cauldra is going to be enough to do anything here, but it's what we got to try. So opponent suspends Crashing Footfalls. We draw Ephemerate. 
Okay, so play Stoneforge Mystic. Uh, let's go and get Cauldra. Pass the turn. Now we do have Ephemerate if we need to protect Stoneforge Mystic. I think my opponent is just missing a third land. They're probably holding a Cascade spell. I wouldn't doubt it in the slightest. They suspend another Crashing Footfalls. Okay. And they are going to evoke Fury by pitching Violent Outburst. Okay. So let's Ephemerate Stoneforge. And we'll go and get Fire and Ice. Okay. So they lose Fury. Pass the turn. We untap. Going to put Cauldra into play. Living Weapon. So Ephemerate rebounds. And we will flicker a Stoneforge again. Technically thinning our deck here, increasing our chances of drawing a land. Uh, I will get Maul of the Skyclaves. We draw a Maria's Call. So play a Maria Shattered Skyclave. We will pay the extra cost here. Go to combat. Attack our opponent for five. They take five and go to 12. So we play Charming Prince. And we could scry, because a flicker spell would not be bad. But I think we're just going to flicker Stoneforge again and go get Batter Skull. Okay, we got all the equipment out of our deck. Pass the turn. Crashing Footfalls, ticking down. Three and two. So we have seven damage on board. Opponent dead and gone to kill Stoneforge Mystic. We untap. We draw a Concealed Courtyard, which unfortunately we cannot have come into the battlefield untapped this turn, which means we cannot equip Sword of Fire and Ice. Um, but I can play Concealed Courtyard tapped, and we can play Maul of the Skyclaves. Now my opponent could have another Dead and Gone, so there's some risk to attaching this to Charming Prince. Okay. Never mind, go to combat, attack for seven. Hit them to seven, pass the turn. Or hit them to five, excuse me. Hit them four seven, take them to five. Opponent untaps. Now I think my opponent got relatively unlucky this game. Um not being able to draw a land to play a Cascade spell. Uh, they, on other ways, got lucky because they did not uh, draw a Bounce spell for the token. Um, they had to suspend the Crashing Footfalls that they drew. But at the same time, they've also had answers for practically everything. Uh, us mulliganing to four makes it very unlikely for us to win. Uh, so I'm happy we were able to uh, tie that game up. Uh, in a victory. So we're going to bring in Dranith Magistrate, Chalice of the Void. I think that's uh, our best bet versus what our opponent is doing. Uh, Truth and Justice doesn't really help us. Uh, it stops bounce spells, but our opponent, I think, is mainly going to be trying to counter. Uh, I think I'm going to get rid of Kaya's Guile. Um, hmm. What else am I cutting for these cards? Skyclave Apparition is great because it answers the tokens. I think Callous Blood Mage is actually quite bad. Solitude's also okay because they make a bunch of 4-4s four and we're going to need to answer them. Um, it's possible I drop Persist here or a land. Land is a bit risky. I'm going to drop a Charming Prince. We'll try it like this. If my opponent doesn't have a way to answer us casting a Grief um, and like ephemerating it, if that's our opening hand, then they're going to be in trouble. Um, I do want to keep this. Chalice might actually encourage my opponent to counter if they've got it. Um, we can play a Stoneforge Mystic on turn two. We already are holding Batter Skull and Maul, though. I think we have better openers, so I'm actually going to mulligan. This isn't better. I think my opponent kept seven. Yeah, okay. I'm going to go to five. Dranith Magistrate, Marius Call, Hive of the Eye Tyrant. So I'd have to put back two cards. And it would probably be a Maria's Call and Hive if I were to keep this hand. All right, let's try it. It's not great. But it leads on Misty Rainforest. Shocks a Stomping Ground. Suspends Crashing Footfalls. Okay. We untap. We draw Urborg. Play Concealed Courtyard. Pass the turn. If my opponent misses a land drop, I will not be playing Dranith Magistrate until turn three. If they play a land here, 
uh, which they should, I will probably hold on to Dranith Magistrate for a turn. Especially, I mean, I have to if they cast Ice, obviously. Okay. Well, they always seem to have it, so. We draw Malakir Rebirth. Um, play Silent Clearing. Pass the turn. Crashing Footfalls, ticking down to two. Opponent shocks a Hollowed Fountain. And unfortunately, they have the Shardless Agent. So they're going to be making some Rhinos. Well, the good news is we can play Dranith Magistrate, which might force them to answer it. Uh, and then we can Skyclave and Flicker it. So we get them all of the Skyclaves. Play Dranith Magistrate. Pass the turn. We have Malakir Rebirth here. I do need to draw another land. Okay, opponent goes to combat. They attack for 10. We're going to see if we can't draw a burn spell from them. Okay, take 8, go to 12. I think I would like to draw a basic planes if we could find one. Okay. Cast Malakir Rebirth. So we lose a bunch of life. Opponent draws and discards. Yeah, we really, really need to draw a white source. Opponent plays a tap land. Three cards left. We untap. We draw Grief, which we cannot cast. Okay. This is painful because we won't be able to Ephemerate, uh, which means we're taking another hit from the Rhinos. But, oh, it can't hit tokens. Oh, yeah, that's a problem. All right. Pass the turn. Kano doesn't read. Well, so far we've not hit our crazy opener versus our opponent, which I think if we do, practically guarantees we beat them. Like, if our opening hand was... Grief, Black Card, White Land, Ephemerate, Chalice. Any, anything else. I think that's like a guaranteed victory. So opponent cannot cast Crashing Footfalls here. Unless, of course, they have a Bounce Spell. So I need to draw exactly... Nothing, I can't. Uh, I'd need four mana to draw Dam. So that's a loss. There's no single card here that can uh, get us out of this. Okay, um, so Skyclave Apparition apparently says non-token, which means it's actually horrible here. Um, in that case, we're going to drop the Skyclave Apparitions uh, to bring back in a Kaya's Guile and a uh, Charming Prince. We'll try it like that. All right, we'll play first. Um, I, I think we got a mulligan because we definitely have better starts, and I think this counts. So... I'm putting back Batter Skull with this hand and checking to see if our opponent mulligans. They keep seven. All right. Well, I really don't want to mulligan and risk getting an even worse hand. So we are going to start by playing Chalice on zero, then playing Ameria Shattered Skyclave. Pass the turn. All right. Opponent untaps. They play a forest. They pass. They were going to suspend Crashing Footfalls there, I'm pretty sure. Play Stoneforge Mystic. We'll go and get Cauldra, because it's the highest payoff potential. I mean, if my opponent has, I guess, Force of Vigor, that would be a problem for us. They play a Mountain. They kill Stoneforge Mystic and suspend Crashing Footfalls. So they must be confident that in the next however many turns, they can get rid of the Chalice. So we're going to Scry kind of want to draw both of these cards. The problem is I would have to evoke the grief and I have no payoff for it. Um, I mean, I guess I could hard cast it, but not for two turns from now. So maybe this is a fine next couple of turns. That way I also can maybe have a use for Kaya's Guile. Crashing Footfalls, ticking down. Kind of interesting that we've played against two Cascade decks right in a row. Opponent plays a tap land, passes. We draw Dranith Magistrate, go to combat. Attack for two. We hit our opponent to 18. Play Dranith Magistrate. Play Concealed Courtyard. Pass the turn. So next turn we'll be hard casting Grief. Um, and we might be able to answer whatever our opponent's answer are, is to these threats. Uh, if they have, they probably have Brazen Borrower, actually. Uh, okay. So they fetch with Misty Rainforest. They get a Hollowed Fountain. The opponent plays a Nahiri. They are going to loot away Emmercool. Scary. All right, we untap. We draw Grief. So we can attack Nahiri for two or three. Um, 
I don't want to attack with the Magistrate because I don't want to give them another down tick option. So we're going to actually cast Grief here first. Okay, opponent did not have a subtlety for that Grief, as much as I hate saying those words. Opponent has a Fire and Ice and a Brazen Borrower, so we're going to exile Brazen Borrower, go to combat, attack Nahiri for two. We're not going to attack with the Magistrate. Opponent has two Violent Outbursts right now, which don't really do anything. So opponent can use Fire to kill Grief, which kind of puts us at a deadlock of trying to kill this Nahiri uh, until we draw like another Stoneforge Mystic. Um, they could use Fire to kill Charming Prince, although I don't know why they would. I think they need to uptick Nahiri and loot away a Cascade spell to try and find something else. Uh, unless they drew an answer that kills Dranith Magistrate somehow, and like if they drew another Brazen Borrower, and uh, in that case they could down tick Nahiri to exile Chalice, Brazen Borrower, Dranith Magistrate on our turn. Okay, opponent ices Dranith Magistrate. Down ticks Nahiri to kill Dranith Magistrate. So they must have an answer to um chalice so we have to kill nahiri i'm um, not going to cast anything else right now we'll just pass so kaya's guile probably is going to be an edict here to kill one of the tokens um yeah that sucks not a lot i can do about that that means my opponent is going to get two crashing footfalls this turn i really really dislike that uh, the cards that most commonly disrupt my opponent's deck are answerable by main deck cards in my opponent's deck. So we make them sack, get a 1-1, untap, draw Silent Clearing, play Silent Clearing, thankfully, play Chalice on zero. Okay, it resolves. They were not interested in Cascading, which tells me they have another answer. So go to combat, and we'll attack for one in the air. I'm not going to attack with Grief or Charming Prince, because it's very, very, very likely that my opponent has a way to deal with that Chalice and then Cascade. They could have another Brazen Borrower, etc. Opponent cracks Misty Rainforest, gets an Island. Are they just casting Brazen Borrower here? Prismari Command, creating a treasure, destroying an artifact. Um... So they're going to go for the double cascade. Do I have any way to protect this artifact in this deck? I don't have anything that flickers a permanent. Um, getting another flicker on Grief or Charming Prince doesn't really do anything. Yeah, because that only exiles creatures. Okay, I guess this is happening. Yeah, like I said, I wish this deck was easier to interact with, but they can just run a bunch of main deck spells that coincidentally destroy or kill... Uh, the things that their deck is bad against. So they get to make Rhinos. Okay. They untap. They could flash in Solitude now. Um, they have a Violent Outburst in hand. I guess that's actually fine. I don't want them to be able to hard cast a Solitude to answer this. And while I, there could be like a gotcha, I could get them on blocks. I, I don't think it's worth it. So opponent's going to gain four life here. If I could draw Sword of Fire and Ice... Um, and suit up Grief or Solitude with it, that'd be fantastic. Opponent attacks us for 8. Sure. We go to 11. Shardless Agent. So they're holding Violent Outbursts as his Crashing Footfalls number 3. We untap. We draw Agadim's Awakening. Cycle Clearing. We get a Dam. Uh, so I have to bolt myself to cast that. And if I do... My opponent will just Violent Outburst next turn and make more tokens. And then what do we do? Like, we won't be able to get Cauldra down. Um, let's see, if my opponent attacks and we block in such a way to prevent as much damage as possible, we can block down a Rhino and gain 3 life, so we'd be at 14. Then we can almost block another whole Rhino. Or we can Chump Shardless and Chump a Rhino which would mean we would then take 10 damage while being at 14, and my opponent could cast Violent Outburst, which would kill us because of the power and toughness pump, 
which means I have no choice but to cast Agadim's Awakening this turn. Uh, or not cast Agadim's Awakening, but cast Dam, which really sucks. Okay, I'm gonna block some blocks. I take one, we gain three. Play Agadim the Undercrypt. Overload Dam. Pass the turn. We need some very good top decks. Because our opponent is holding Violent Outburst 1 Unknown. <laughs> That's a very good top deck for our opponent. It means they're not Violent Outbursting, um, but they are going to get close to a Emrakul very quickly. We untap. We draw a Silent Clearing. Um, so we can either hold out for another untap land to cast Cauldra, or we can cycle this to try and find something quicker. If I try and cast Cauldra, my opponent can make blockers in response, and while we exile both of them, that would guarantee Nahiri gets to 8. So we really don't have a choice except to cycle this. Okay, play Stoneforge Mystic. And we, as much as I would love to get Sword of Fire and Ice, I think we have to get Maul of the Skyclaves. Pass the turn. Because uh, that's the only thing we can use to guaranteed kill Nahiri. Actually, maybe I needed to... Uh, maybe I needed to get Batter Skull because they're just going to outburst and get tokens. I don't know why they're doing it on their upkeep. Oh, I guess so they don't draw their last Crashing Footfalls. So what happens next is going to depend pretty wildly on um, what we draw and what our opponent drew. Because we might be able to kill Nahiri, but then we might just die to the Rhinos as well. Opponent looted away a Fury. We untap. We draw an Undying Evil. So... Put a Cauldra into play. Put a Maul of the Skyclaves into play. Actually, this doesn't even kill Nahiri because we're uh, a little bit short on power and toughness here. Go to combat. Attack Nahiri so she cannot alt. We are dead to bounce. We are dead to three points of burn, which I don't think my opponent can actually have because I think all their burn is two points that can go to face. But I think it's just fire. Uh, we were dead to an ice there, which means they don't have fire and ice. Um... Or at least their last card in hand, right? That kills us. They loot with Nahiri. They ditch another Teferi and draw a card. They play Misty, which means they can flash Brazen Borrower on our end step, so Wrath is not an out. Take eight, go to three, we untap. Draw Planes, uh, which unfortunately means we can't equip Cauldra, we can't bounce Cauldra like we can Batter Skull. Um, yeah, I really needed to get Batter Skull instead of Maul of the Skyclaves, but I think even if I did, we were just dead because my opponent could just Teferi answered it. So, um, and I had to put Cauldra into play then, so I wouldn't have been able to play Batter Skull until this turn, which means Teferi would still, or not Teferi, Nahiri would still have. She would be at five counters now. I can equip the Maul, but that doesn't even give us enough toughness to block. So. They really got to do something about this modern metagame. I hate the fact that the deck that I'm playing exists, and I hate the fact that I played against two Cascade decks in a row. All right, see you guys in round three. All right, we're against a deck playing Kahira the Orphan Guard, which the only deck I know that plays that card is a version of Five Color Elementals. So I think this is the Elemental Cascade deck, which means I'm going to try and mulligan for a Grief Hand. Even though that first hand was fine, maybe Solitude Ephemerate's enough. All right, let's try it. We'll put back Callus Blood Mage, and Kaya's Guile. Okay, opponent starts tap land. We draw another Ephemerate. Shock, pass the turn. Opponent plays a Windswept Teeth and passes. We draw Planes. Play a Planes. Play Mystic. Let's go and get Cauldra. Pass the turn. Opponent fetches with Windswept Teeth. Probably gets a uh, Teamer Triome. Mindatha, okay. They untap. They play a Risen Reef. Sure. They get a Cavern. We untap, we draw a Maria's Call. So play a Maria Shattered Skyclave, put Cauldra into play, Living Weapon, go to combat, attack for five. So I suspect, my, I suspect my opponent is going to play Omnath, and if they do, we're gonna Solitude in response to the triggers to kill both their creatures. Lightning Skelemental, that will also be Ephemerated, or Solitude Ephemerated. So Evoke Solitude, hit Lightning Skelemental, Opponent is going to ephemerate the Skelemental in response. Okay. It just gives them an additional Risen Reef trigger. We'll ephemerate the Solitude. Exile Skelemental. So Risen Reef gets them another Cavern. Second set of Solitude triggers doesn't do anything. 
and they hit a Sacred Foundry. Okay, opponent probably is not attacking with Risen Reef. So Ephemerate Stoneforge Mystic. We will go and get a Sword of Fire and Ice. And we draw Grief. Well, we can't cast Grief. Um, and if I play Sword, I can't play Ephemerate, which is really my only way of removing anything this turn. So I'm going to attack for eight, and I think I hold up the Ephemerate here is slightly safer. Pass the turn. Okay. Ephemerate coming off suspend for our opponent. Now I could Ephemerate Solitude now, and then exile Risen Reef. You know what? Sure. Let's do it. Flicker Solitude, exile Risen Reef. This does stop them from gaining quite a bit of value. It also means we can flicker Stoneforge again. Or if my opponent were to play Omnath and somehow not just kill us instantly, we could exile Omnath. It may even stop our opponent from exiling Omnath. Okay. Opponent plays Thunderkin Awakener. I suppose if they have another Lightning Skelemental, we could be in trouble. Okay, they play Omnath, Locus of the Royal. So it deals damage to any target equal to the number of elementals you control. Uh, so they can hit Stoneforge Mystic with this. They kill Solitude. Interesting. And then they play Omnath, Locus of the... Or they play Windswept Teeth, which pumps the Thunderkin Awakener. They go to combat. Attack us for two. No blocks. So we untap. Ephemerate. Rebounds. We'll target Stoneforge Mystic. Oh, I needed to activate it in response. I needed to hold priority there, and I did not. That was my bad. Get Batter Skull. We draw Skyclave Apparition. Well, I kind of punted into the correct line because disregarding... Like, I should have put Sword of Fire and Ice into play there. Skyclave Apparition hitting Locus is a much better play. We're hitting Omnath. Uh, opponent might have another Ephemerate, and if they do, that's pretty good. They fetch a Stomping Ground tapped. They do not control eight lands, but they can make Thunderkin Awakener bigger. Hit our opponent for five. They go to seven. Opponent plays a Voice of Resurgence and a Fulminator Mage. They take out our black mana. They get back Fulminator Mage. Uh, no blocks. Take five. I should have offered the trade with Fulminator. Because now they can kill the uh, other land we need to activate Stoneforge for free. Okay, opponent has a second Thunderkin Awakener. We untap. We draw Charming Prince. Go to combat. Attack our opponent for five. They take five and go to two. They untap. So I imagine now they put Kahira in their hand and play her. Unless they drew something better than that. She's going to pump all elementals. Okay. So they are attacking for exactly 11, which means we do have to block. Everything has Vigilance. Um, so by blocking, we give them a token. The token is blue. Uh, but we cannot play out Sword and equip it. We'd have to put in Batter Skull anyway. Uh, so we just block the most damage we can. Okay. Opponent gets a 4-4 token. They sack Fulminator Mage. We untap. We draw Persist, opponent has enough toughness to block, and uh, that's going to be game. Yep, Fulminator buybacks are pretty good. So, versus our opponent's deck, which is playing Million Color Elementals, uh, I think we do want Leyline because of Thunderkin Awakener, as well as a few other um, like miscellaneous powerful interactions. Uh, what else do we want here? They don't really cast spells from anywhere other than their hands. We don't need Dranith Magistrate. Uh, they don't really play artifacts, so we don't need Kataki or Stony Silence. They don't have Planeswalkers. They don't really play artifacts or enchantments, so Fracture is bad. We might want Sword of Truth and Justice. Protection from blue and white could matter. Chalice doesn't really help either. I think it's just the Ley Lines of the Void. Um, and in this case, I think that means we do not want... Persist? Is that right? No, I think we still want Persist. I think we'll drop Kaya's Guile, Charming Prince, and maybe a Malakir Rebirth. Try like this. Alright, we'll play first. Um, this hand does not do a whole lot, so I think I'm going to mulligan. This hand has some potential. I think I can make this work. Going to put back Urborg. 
play Concealed Courtyard, pass the turn. We're going to try and get a Solitude Undying Evil play, I think. I kept Agadim's Awakening in case we drew Grief. Okay, opponent does have Aether Vial. Alright, we've got Grief. So, let's go with the Grief play, I think. Stack the triggers correctly. We can take... Wow, opponent has basically nothing. Take Flamekin Harbinger. Undying Evil. Evoke. Take Force of Vigor. And my opponent has four cards in their hand. So it's like these lands. Pass the turn. Now if we draw a land, we can Skyclave Apparition to take out Aether Vial and... And they have nothing. Literal nothing. Opponent plays a Sacred Foundry tapped. We untap and draw another Grief, which is not super useful. Hit them for four. Aether Vial ticking up to two. Opponent plays a Forest. They play Risen Reef. Okay. Risen Reef trigger. They draw a card. That's scary. We untap. We draw Maul of the Skyclaves. Go to combat. Attack for four. Pass the turn. I'm probably going to have to end up pitching Maul to Solitude. Opponent takes up Aether Vial to three. And depending on what my opponent plays is going to dictate what we're trying to hit with Solitude. Yeah. Exile Maul to Solitude. We're going to exile Risen Reef. Opponent has Ephemerate. That's bad. By bad, I mean tremendously so. They hit a tap land. So we lose. Opponent played a one mana mind rot that drew them a card and played a land. So now opponent can stack the triggers to tutor up any elemental they want, which is probably going to be another Risen Reef, and then they can vial it in and get a million triggers and refill their hand. They get Thunderkin Awakener, so they can get back Flamekin Harbinger every turn. That seems good. So they play Thunderkin Awakener, another Risen Reef trigger. At least this is an interesting tribal deck. An interesting tribal deck that is trying to play, like, somewhat fairly. And I say somewhat fairly because, like, they do mostly just cast creature spells and cast, like, on-theme elementals. I mean, they do have some pretty broken interactions, such as uh, Fulminator Mage and whatnot, but... Okay, take a bunch of damage. And then we're gonna get Stone Rained. Okay, here comes the Stone Rain. Mm-hmm. All right, let's go ahead and scoop it up. I'll see you guys in round four. All right, welcome back to round four. Um, I mean, this hand basically just has Stoneforge with Solitude back up. I think we can do better. Uh, it's a mulligan as well. This is really close and I think is actually worth keeping. I'm going to put back Solitude and Sky... Crap. Actually, I shouldn't have kept this hand. I shouldn't have kept this hand because my idea was like, oh, we'll just evoke grief and then... Um, we can persist it on turn two, and then that'll be worth it. But I don't have anything to evoke grief with. Uh, so I'm going to put back Skyclave Apparition, and I guess... Does this mean I actually have to put back, like, grief and Skyclave? That's the worst of both worlds. Let's put back Solitude and Skyclave Apparition. Play Agadim the Undercrypt. Maybe it was still correct to evoke grief on turn one, but... Bona plays an island. We untap. We draw Charming Prince. Play Hive of the Eye Tyrant. Pass the turn. Opponent opts. May untap. They play another Snow Island. We untap. We get a Godless Shrine. All right. Play Godless Shrine. Play Charming Prince. So, I don't know how many people watch enough of my videos to know, but the deck that I'm currently playing, I have played against various iterations of, and a lot of them were really early in the current, like, rotation of modern, post-modern Horizons 2. I haven't really seen this deck since then. Opponent counterspells the Prince. Okay, pass the turn. And... Every single time we played against this deck, maybe minus a game or two, my opponent had Grief Ephemerate or Grief Malakir Rebirth on turn one. Every time. And I've been mulliganing to like five, and in some cases four, every game with the intent of having one of these crazy turn zero plays. And we've done it, what, once? Now I know it's not the most likely card or the most likely play. Uh, I know it's not the most likely thing to occur. Actually, I had it there, and I probably should have gone for it, but I wasn't paying attention because I was ranting, and I kind of wanted to cast Kaya's Guile, but I committed halfway to two lines and took the, took the worst one, but 
I I know Kano is probably a bit unlucky. Kano doesn't read. Kano doesn't make his own luck all the time. But like, if you grief ephemerate on turn one, you're like guaranteed to win. And we've been mulliganing trying to make that happen, and it just isn't. So, I mean, if we have a, a terrible league and we lose because of it, that's why. Like, it's not because you know, uh, it's not because of any other reason. Opponent goes to combat. They're going to attack us for two. This takes four mana to animate, so we're pretty far off of that. Okay, on their end step, uh, we'll make them sack and we'll make a 1-1. One, one. Untap. We draw Skyclave Apparition, which we cannot cast. Go to combat. Attack Jace, 4-1. Then I'm going to persist this Charming Prince, because I really need to scry into another land. Opponent has Force of Negation, pitching Ice Fang Quaddle. Okay, pass the turn. All right, opponent does nothing. We untap. We draw Silent Clearing. So play the Clearing. Go to combat. We do not have good answers to Jace, by the way. There is roughly a 0% chance this attack even lands, but even if we Skyclave Apparition Jace and it gets Jace off the board, that 4-4 is actually going to be kind of tough for us to deal with. Quaddle is basically what I was worried about. I know they pitched one to Force already, and that technically means it's less likely for them to have one, but... Hmm. Okay. So I also know that you can flicker Skyclave Apparition, or you should be able to, to put the Leave the Battlefield trigger on top of the enters the battlefield trigger so they don't get the token but we don't have enough white mana here to actually accomplish that so like our hope is our opponent's holding five lands and draws a sixth then we skyclave apparition jace they untap play a land do nothing uh we grief to confirm they have lands in their hand and then ephemerate to grief them again i guess i don't know because if they're holding all lands then the grief ephemerate plan is actually bad um us playing persist might have tipped them off uh, but I don't think they've seen Grief yet. If Skyclave Apparition gets countered or otherwise answered, uh, probably just going to scoop here. Okay. Exile Jace. Pass the turn. Okay, opponent plays a Quaddle. It's a redraw. Plays a land. Cracks Polluted Delta. Shocks a Breeding Pool. Prismatic Ending. Well, I can flicker it to take out the Quaddle, but I think that's better saved for Grief, completely honestly. We untap. We draw Planes. Play planes, play grief. All right, grief resolves. Opponent has batter skull, nothing else. All right, so we're still in this game. So stop on my opponent's draw step. Ephemerate. We're gonna need some pretty good top decks on our part to get out of this. We're really hoping to nab like a uh, Teferi or something. All right, Stoneforge Mystic. It was something. Opponent plays a Hollow Fountain tapped. They probably just get aggressive here. Oh, well, they don't. All right. Well, we're not going to ephemerate anything. We draw Stoneforge. Play Stoneforge. Uh, we'll get Sword, and we are immediately going to play Sword. It's much harder for them to answer on board unless they top deck a Prismatic Ending. They're more likely to top deck a Counterspell, especially with one they've already cast, unless they drew Snapcaster. They get Ice Fang as a redraw. They play Flooded Strand. They pass. They have Misty and one Unknown in hand. We draw Undying Evil. Suit up Grief, go to combat, attack for five, opponent cannot block. Um, do we start killing Quaddles? No, I think we hit our opponent because it shortens the clock. We'll get an Amarius call, play Amarius Shattered Skyclave tapped. Getting all the way up to seven mana is somewhat reasonable here. Okay, opponent plays a Misty. Right now our opponent's best draw is probably Wrath. I could block with the Stoneforge Mystic here, but I do not think it is worth it. Um, even though I could Undying Evil. Let's go ahead and sack to draw. Draw land. Untap. We get a Charming Prince. So play Concealed Courtyard. Go to combat. They could like Cryptic Tap. Or they could even bounce the sword. Attack for five. Now they could like Cryptic Bounce Sword and then double block. So we hit our opponent for five. We'll take out a Quaddle. We get a Solitude. Play Charming Prince. Let's go ahead and flicker Stoneforge. Okay, game's over. I'm glad we were able to get the win there. <clears throat> so versus my opponent's deck, I think I want Fracture. Um, is it better than Dam? It might be. The problem is there are situations where we're going to want to cast Dam Overloaded to catch back up on board, though we're probably losing those. Like, it has to deal with, like, Skyclave Apparition giving them tokens and then them playing a bunch of Ice Fang Quaddles. I just don't know how likely that is. So I think we're going to cut those. 
I'm probably going to cut Persist because I think um, my opponent's probably going to bring in some Grave Hate, which makes the Undying Evil and Malakir Rebirth plan worse. Uh, Sword of Truth and Justice seems reasonable here. That's probably better than an Undying Evil. Actually, it's probably better than the other Persist. Um, I could bring in Leyline because they have Snapcaster, but I think that's bad, so we're just going to run back. All right. Mm, if we had a white land, this hand would be amazing. But we do not, so we need to mulligan that hand. All right, I can work with this. I'm going to put back Amaria's Call. Okay, opponent leads on Flooded Strand. We untap, we draw Sword of Truth and Justice. Play Concealed Courtyard. Evoke Grief. Okay, Thought sees our opponent. They have Spell Pierce, Prismatic Ending, Opt. Take, uh, take Spell Pierce. Now Ephemerate. And I bet our opponent wishes they were playing Path. We finally got that, like, excessively powerful start that I was just complaining about not having. So let's see if it's actually any good, huh? So Thought sees them again. Prismatic Ending and Opt. Take Opt from them. Prismatic Ending cannot get up to four in the time that it is going to be relevant. So next turn we can untap, rebound, Ephemerate Grief again. Opponent has Cauldra and Prismatic Ending. So take Prismatic Ending. Then we draw Hive of the Eye Tyrant. Play it, play Charming Prince, and we will slow flicker Grief and take Cauldra from them. So opponent is now holding a breeding pool. Well, when you thought sees your opponent 47 times in the first two turns, hopefully that's enough to win. We do have a great follow-up in Sword of Truth and Justice here. This opponent has to do something with breeding pool. They play it tapped. We untap. We draw another Grief. Uh, go to combat. Attack for five. Opponent goes to 14. Play Concealed Courtyard. Play Sword of Truth and Justice. Pass the turn. Opponent untaps. Um, if they have a fourth color of mana and a prismatic ending for grief, that might do it. Man, what are the odds they have an instant speed removal spell? Probably less than them having a counter spell, so we're just going to equip. Go to combat. Attack, attack. Okay. So we are going to put a 1-1 one, one counter here, then proliferate here. Uh, then we then we pass. We can hard cast a Grief. They're not legendary. When a Cracks Misty Rainforest goes down to 6, they get an island. They untap. They opt. And they scoop. So yeah, Grief Ephemerate is crazy powerful. And if you just happen to be lucky enough to have a start like that every game, this is the deck you should be playing. Because I guarantee you that beats any of the opponents we played. Except maybe the Elemental player. Uh, the Elemental, the Five Color Elementals deck, has hands that can recover from a Grief. As we experienced, they can just draw Risen Reef and then draw more cards than you could ever hope to Grief them for. So, I will see you all in round five. Alrighty. Uh, welcome back to round five. Took a break in recording there. Uh, I will be keeping this because this is a turn one Grief plus Malakir Rebirth. Um, so yeah, let's do it. Evoke Grief. Stack the triggers correctly. Take a peek at what we're dealing with here. Oh yeah, yeah, I see. Um, well, take Lotus Bloom. I th so this is, this is Ad Nauseam. If I were to take two cards that would most impact my opponent... Uh, I think currently limiting their mana development, and then taking Unlife. Maybe Grace. Taking Grace, I think, would be better. So take Lotus Bloom, Malakir Rebirth, Evoke, then... I mean, they get Cantrips here. Maybe taking Serum Visions would be better, because that stops them from digging for mana. Sleight of Hand works for digging for mana, but Serum Visions is way better at it. Alternatively, I take Grace, and that stops them from ever using a Pact of Negation or anything similar. Normally, I would just take combo pieces. I know if I take the Cantrip, my luck is my opponent's going to draw a second land naturally anyway. So, let's take... let's take Profane Tutor. I think that is their most powerful consistency tool. So, game one, with this start, this should be... this should be a very quick win for us, hopefully. Especially if we can draw Stoneforge Mystic or anything we can use to increase the clock. So 
The real concern is my opponent just top decks the combo anyway, because they can absolutely do that. There's nothing stopping them from just like cantripping into the lands they need, and then Angel's Grace spoils Thassa's Oracle on four mana, because uh, currently our clock is not faster than that. Um, if they can get to where they can like play Phyrexian Unlife or anything like that, uh, this of course is significantly worse. <laughs> um, okay, opponent leads on Sea Chrome Coast, Sleight of Hand. We untap. We draw Emeria's Call, so play Godless Shrine, go to combat, hit our opponent for three. They go to 17, they untap. Opponent casts a Serum Visions. If they leave a card on top, that's bad. If they don't, they put one card on the top and one card on the bottom. They did find their second land. We untap, we draw a Stoneforge Mystic, so play Concealed Courtyard. Go to combat, attack our opponent for three. Hit them to 14, play Stoneforge Mystic. Let's go and get Cauldra. That's just the fastest clock we've got. Opponent untaps. Uh, without another grief, I don't think there's a way for us to answer Phyrexian Unlife. Um, so it's going to cause problems for us trying to deal with our opponent's life total. Uh, basically, we'll give them at least an extra turn, probably to opponent Drew Planes. Opponent suspends Profane Tutor. Okay. We draw a Sword of Fire and Ice. So... Let me do math here. If I put in Cauldra, and we hit them for 8, they go to 6. Um, then next turn I can play an Equip Sword of Fire and Ice to Cauldra. The first strike damage can take them below 0, and then we can shoot them for extra damage and hit them with Grief. Uh, I think that is the play. So go ahead and put Cauldra into play. Living Weapon. Go to combat. Attack for 8. Opponent goes to 6. Play Emeria Shattered Skyclave. Tapped. Pass the turn. Profane Tutor ticking down. It may not be fast enough. It still may not be fast enough. Especially if my opponent has a land here and can Phyrexian on life plus Angel's Grace. Because uh, that keeps them above zero, which is a huge, huge time sink for us trying to kill them. Okay, we untap. We draw Charming Prince. Okay, um... So they have Unlife. We know they have Angel's Grace. There's a decision to make here. Now, we can either put in Sword... Equip, Phyrex equip the Phyrexian Germ and start dealing infect damage this turn. Or we can play Charming Prince, Flicker Grief, get a Thought Seize, and hopefully disrupt the combo. The problem is if we take any one card, they just immediately get it back off Profane Tutor. Um, so if they have all of the combo pieces in hand, that actually does nothing. But if they have all of the combo pieces in hand, we're losing anyway. So I think the play which really sucks, is to just attack with um, these two creatures. Opponent will go to negative two, but with no infect counters, because damage is not dealt as though it has infect until you have zero or less life. Okay, so then we Charming Prince, Flicker Grief, Thought Seize our opponent. <laughs> so they have Thassa's Oracle, Spoils... Uh, and that's exactly enough to win off of Profane Tutor. Anything I take, they can just tutor for and win. Uh, that's bad luck. I guess we'll take Oracle. Maybe they're only playing one. Oh, actually, they don't have the mana. Um, because their only blue mana is also their only black mana. Their only second blue mana, I should say. So, if they have the combo, they still need the mana to pull it off. Oh, we got there. Nice. Okay. <clears throat> So, versus our opponent, uh, we're definitely bringing in Chalice. Uh, they play a lot of zero drops, and we need to be able to answer those zero drops. Fracture is also going to be important. Dranith Magistrate will be important. Now, Kataki is less good, but still good. I think Stony Silence does warrant inclusion, though. Um, and our opponent does not use the Grave, so Leyline is not helpful here. So, I am going to trade out Kaya's Guile, Sword of Fire and Ice... Um, Callous Blood Mage is quite bad here. Skyclave Apparition is actually good. And I think Solitude's just gotta, like, straight up come out of the deck. Um, along with Dam, maybe. Actually, I'm gonna leave in a Callous Blood Mage and take out the Dams. Now, it is a problem if our opponent does have Leyline, um, of Sanctity. That means we're basically gonna have to have Fracture in order to win. But we'll take out these cards to add these cards, and we'll try it like this. Uh, yeah. I will be keeping this. Hopefully they do not have a ley line. They mulligan to six. Okay, they kept six. 
They lead on Sea Chrome Coast, Serum Visions. All right, let's see what they do with their Scries. Put both cards on top, and they exile a Lotus Bloom. All right, we draw Persist. So play Hive of the Eye Tyrant. Uh, grief our opponent. All right, let's get a Thought Seize off here. They have Thassa's Oracle, Angel's Grace. We'll take Oracle from them. Undying Evil. Evoke, get it back. Uh, take Angel's Grace. And then pass the turn. So opponent put two cards on top of their deck. I'm interested to see what they are. Uh, they drew Serum Visions. So they get to draw one more new card. We don't know what it is. They play Clearwater Pathway. We untap. We draw Chalice. So play Emeria Shattered Skyclave. Bolt Ourself. Play Dranith Magistrate. Go to combat. Attack for four. Now the Magistrate can stop them from casting Lotus Bloom. Uh, I am very tempted to put Chalice on one, as it is very unlikely that we will need to cast any of our one drops, although I'm very hesitant to shut off our deck. If I put Chalice on zero, it stops them as a redundancy of casting Lotus Bloom. Um, it stops them from casting Pact of Negation, but it does not stop them from casting their combo pieces. And so I think I'm going to put Chalice of the Void on one this game, because that just shuts off like their entire deck. They can still technically combo, but they will not be able to do so without an answer for Chalice and an answer for Dranith Magistrate, I think, um, very, very shortly. So the only thing I didn't play around here by playing Chalice on zero was a Slaughter Pact. We untap, we draw a Maria's Call, go to combat, attack for five, take our opponent to 11, um, play Agadim the Undercrypt tapped, Chalice on one, pass the turn. So opponent will not be able to cast this Lotus Bloom unless they have a Slaughter Pact for Dranith Magistrate. Okay. They cannot cast Cantrips. They cannot cast Angel's Grace. They cannot cast Spoils of the Vault. Um, they won't be able to cast... What is that spell? Fragmentation? The one white mana destroy an artifact or enchantment CMC4 or less. Uh, they won't be able to cast Path. So like the way that our opponent gets out of this is by top decking like Unlife into... Patrician Scorn? No, Patrician Scorn is only enchantments that it destroys. Um, Patrician Scorn was one of my favorite tech pieces out of uh, out of Ad Nauseam, because Patrician Scorn meant that if you cast Angel's Grace Ad Nauseam, uh, you could answer any number of Leyline of Sanctities without play without mana. So like I played Patrician Scorn over Echoing Truth in my Ad Nauseam sideboard, uh, which I think it's just a four mana instant from Future Sight that says if you've cast another white spell this turn, you can cast it for free, and it just destroys all enchantments. Um, it's one of my favorite cards for that reason. Because, like, when you're when you're playing against an Ad Nauseam-style deck, the the trick to beating them is understanding how much mana they need to win, and then, what, and then after that, how many cards they need to win. I guess you could reverse those steps. But, like, the way that my opponent wins is, like, Phyrexian on life into some non-one-mana answer to Chalice, so Echoing Truth, etc., into Spoils and Thassa's Oracle. And so that means they're casting a three-mana spell, and then on a later turn, one or two, or actually, you know, zero or two mana, depending on how they're going to answer Chalice, and then they have to have Spoils, and then they have to have Oracle in the same turn. So that's between three and five additional mana on top of them casting Phyrexian Unlight, which they don't currently have. So, like, at a minimum number of turns, that's something like my opponent plays Pentad Prism this turn, uh, then plays some kind of answer for Chalice, uh, plus maybe Unlife, then has Spoil Stasis Oracle. So that's basically a minimum of three turns that they would have to have in order to beat us, and they're dead before that. So unless my opponent has some really crazy plays... And they can't involve Angel's Grace uh, because we do have Chalice on one. They're going to lose. Um, unrelated to the magic game going on right now. Uh, the And I, I just noticed this, so I feel the need to talk about it. So California is currently burning to the ground as it seems to do. Any, um, you know, I hope I hope anybody who lives out that way is doing all because uh, it's, it's pretty bad from my understanding. But here in Utah, especially in the Salt Lake Valley... The air is so, so filled with smoke from that fire, it's actually hazardous to go outside and be outside for any... Because uh, we're currently exposed to, like, five times the number of carbon... Five times the amount or, or concentration of carbon chemicals that, like, the World Health Organization considers safe uh, for, you know, like, human exposure. 
So like they basically are like, stay inside, do not go outside for any reason, limit the exposure that you have to be outside for. So it's like, other than like five second pee breaks for Porter, I have not gone outside. Um, and, um, but the reason I bring all this up is like, I've got a little weather app in like my computer's like status bar across the bottom. And uh, currently the weather is listed as smoke. <laughs> like not rain, not sunny, just smoke. <laughs> anyway, uh, we untap, we draw. Opponent says better lucky than good. LOL. GG's luck god. Like, I'm sure if my opponent were to watch this video, they would see me complaining about how terrible it's been. Uh, whenever we've not had the combo. And when we've had the combo, we won. Um, this is another play pattern that I do not like. Uh, I've explained this in multiple constructed modern videos, generally in the wrap-up at the end. But it's like anything that allows you to virtually... Or, like anything that allows you to virtually win the game should be classified as winning the game as far as wizards of the coast is concerned like they used to they used to say for modern and the definition has changed i think because it was too hard for them to manage with the with the power level they were wanting to print into modern the modern was a turn four format so like you weren't supposed to be able to lose prior to turn four uh, there were some exceptions to this. There were some virtual turn three wins. And I say virtual as in like, it's like a 95% chance you win. And there's like some weird circumstance where you can actually recover. And the example that was generally given was Tron because you would play Karn Liberated on turn three. You'd stone rain an opponent's land. They would be on their turn two because you would be on the play. And then they have two mana if they're holding another land to try and answer Karn and try and come back on the board and then you have to not have another threat you can play and so that was a virtual turn three win um and and there were some other edge cases right of virtual wins but like let's go ahead and open our treasure chest uh ragavan on turn one is a virtual win if unanswered because you cannot come back from the amount of advantage the card generates that early especially if they can protect it and turn one double triple grief is basically a virtual win on turn one now i say virtual again because it's not a guarantee you know if you're playing a person who has a deck like the elemental deck, they can top deck a single card that will give them all of the advantage you strip from them using grief. Let me bring the deck list back up. Um, and basically undo all of your hard work, right? So I think this deck is incredibly degenerate. Um, I think it's very strong. And I do not like the fact that this deck exists. Uh, I think... I think Anything that allows a deck like this to exist should be banned. I really do. Uh, it goes back to my whole, like, I do not like free effects. Because Wizards of the Coast, for a long time, kind of got the free effect balance right. Uh, and that is, basically, for any spell effect that is free, it the only way to balance it basically ends up with the result being the card is too good, as in the free cost is not high enough, or the card is so narrow it is unplayable um, with a, with a non-mana cost. And I can give you an example of each. Um, Force of Will and Associated Grief, Solitude, uh, Endurance. The, like, the card prices alone should tell you that those cards are too strong. Uh, they're too good, they're ubiquitous in the colors that play it. Like, I mean, a little bit less, and obviously, with Grief and Solitude because... The, the decks that abuse them the best are not just every generic deck, but like Force of Negation is basically ubiquitous in any blue deck that is trying to protect its cards or its game plan on its opponent's turn. So any deck that is, you know, slow, there's tempo decks that play it, etc. Um, and like the, the, the other half of that, the cards that are basically unplayable, uh, you have things like Commandeer, Disrupting Shoal, Shining Shoal, um... And uh, what was the card I just named? Patrician Scorn. Those cards are free effects that are balanced. And they're actually, they are technically considered unplayable by most standards. But there are ways to build your deck such that those cards can be played in edge cases. So Patrician Scorn saw edge case play in ad nauseum as a sideboard card a very excellent sideboard card because it did not increase your mana to win if your opponent was playing any form of enchantments and it also had this side note of just completely hosing enduring ideal if you ever ran up against that deck during that time um 
disrupting shoal there was that ninja bear delver deck that played a blue curve all the way up that could actually play disrupting shoal not very well but it was playable and then you would use the ninja to recoup the card advantage that you lost to the free counter spell and all of that went completely by the wayside when they printed Force of Negation. Commandeer, you could play in Time Warp because you were playing Howling Mine effects. You needed a spell effect that was free and had the edge case scenario of if you went up against Tron, you just took their turn three Karn from them. They built Tron and cast Karn to have it enter the battlefield under your control on your side of the field. Then you just stone rain their Tron and then you're like, how does it feel? And then you win. Uh, any Versus anybody who was playing Planeswalkers, it was amazing. Um, this is the kind of free effect that does not need to exist. Does not need to exist. Magic is at its best when people play ma pay mana to get spell effects. Mana is the inherent balance point of the game. I think free effects, like I s I've stated several times already, they have to somehow be narrow enough that they are not busted in every deck that can play them. And generally they should be something that if there's a, if there's a deck they don't want to ban out of the format, uh, they could print a free effect that counters that specific deck. So like when Twin was a problem and they printed Fry, Rending Volley, and all of those other can't be countered, destroy a blue creature or, or five damage to a blue creature, instance which by the way wasn't enough and i think rending volley actually came out after uh twin was banned i think that was their attempt to try and fix twin and they banned twin before it actually came out magic historians can can correct me on that but um they tried printing cards like that and the two mana one that dealt four damage to a blue creature was not strong enough to counter twin because twin on your end step on turn two could tap your land and then you'd only have one land to respond um anyway but like in the example that i'm thinking of if they printed a zero mana version of that effect that was color limited that dealt damage only to creatures that couldn't be countered specifically to combat a deck like twin uh, specifically the combo portion of twin like that would be an effect that is narrow enough with an appropriate cost. And I don't know what that cost is. It could be sacrifice a mountain. It could be exile a red card from your hand. It could be some combination of those things that would make that card unplayable, except in the circumstance it was supposed to be meant for. Then that card could be balanced. Cards like grief, which is just thought sees for free, can't be balanced like that. Like, Think about the kinds of things that this allows you to do. This allows you to abuse flicker effects. This allows you to abuse Vengevine's multiple creature cast effect. This allows you to abuse so many other things. It's a, it puts a creature card in the graveyard. It counts as a sacrifice for effects that count sacrifice or creature death. Like the way that they worded this card was the worst possible way. Like it's a non-creature spell, so even though it's a sorcery speed for the Thought Seize effect, it can't be Force of Negation. Like, maybe maybe it's supposed to be a counter to Force of Negation in that way, but, like, it's still... It's too strong. It does too many things. It's not narrow enough. Like, if this said, you know, you can choose a... What are the enemies of black? White and green? White and green are the enemy color combinations with black, and blue and red are the ally color. So if this said, take a white or green card from your opponent's hand, it would be better. It would still, in my opinion, be too strong, but it would not be as ubiquitous as it is right now. Um, you know, if, if, it, if it didn't evoke, if it, if it did something else, um, if it exiled itself when it entered the battlefield, or something like that. Uh, instead of just like if it had writer text like if this would go to the grave exile it instead um something like that this card would be balanced more balanced than it is but kano it's a modern horizons chase mythic i don't care because the modern horizons chase mythics are cards i don't want to play with in modern i don't want to play with ragavan i don't want to play with grief i don't want to play with solitude I don't want to play with Endurance or Fury or however these other ones they tried to balance. And I don't know if you've noticed, but all of those cards that they tried to balance are broken in the specific decks they show up in. Like, Subtlety showing up in the Cascade deck to counteract your, your grief that you, in theory, can sneak around their Force of Negations they're already playing. Or 
or your fury to answer your opponent's Dranith Magistrate or Thalia or any other number of white taxation creatures, or Solitude even, your free swords to plowshares that you can play in your elemental deck that draws you a card off of X cards off of X Risen Reefs. Like, they do too much. They do too much. And the fact that this deck exists, which is the whole reason I've been discussing any of this, really disgusts me. It's a good deck. It really is a good deck. And if you're lucky, it's an amazing deck. Like, this deck, when you high roll with this deck, you will be basically unbeatable. And when you low roll with this deck, your opponents are playing Solitaire. And you're playing a, did I draw Stoneforge Mystic? Then I'm not doing anything this game deck. <laughs> so, like... And, and I, like, people could draw conclusions to, like, what Free Win Red used to be, which was like, oh, if you high roll with the deck, you just Blood Moon your opponent out of the game. But that was reasonable. And it punished a part of the game that should be punished, which is greedy mana bases. Like, if you played Free Win Red and you were like, and you, you, you came up against an unknown opponent and you were like, turn one Blood Moon, ha, gotcha. And your opponent led, led on, like, any land Aether Vial or let on basic island, you were like, fuck. <laughs> because then you just kept, like, a, a two-card hand that did nothing, right? Because <laughs> then your opponent just, like, by virtue of whatever strategy they were playing, hard-countered you. Not to mention, uh, like, this deck punishes mulligans. Like, your opponent mulliganing versus this deck, it's like mulliganing against 8-Rack. But it's like mulliganing against 8-Rack that's also playing Delver, so they don't even have to, like... They don't even have to, they could just like, you know, or like a Gurmog Angler or some other big threat they could play early. Like, they can just end the game faster. They don't have to wait around for Rack. They don't have to wait and see if you draw a bunch of answers. They can just do whatever they want. Like, I don't know. I think Wizards of the Coast is taking their eternal format direction in the wrong direction. I think they are printing cards that are good and powerful for the sake of being powerful because they think people want to play with powerful cards. Um, I think every time they print a Hogak or a Grief or a Solitude or a, um, a Ragavan, that's another interesting narrow card that didn't get added to the game of Magic and will be irrelevant by the time it does. And that makes me sad. I think that, what was the deck that I played not that long ago? I'll wrap this up quicker. I've, I've got stuff I need to do and I can't sit around and talk all day, but what was that deck I was playing not that long? Snake Tribal running thing like what was it seshiro's or sekiro's summons that was the the three mana sorcery speed raised the alarm that whenever you played a snake you picked it back up and it worked on aether violing your snakes in to recycle the one ones to power up the four mana two two snake that frosted all your opponent's lands whenever it hit your opponent but you had to sack a snake every turn that was a cool deck that was an interesting unique tribal deck that oh like if i want to play a deck like that i can only play snake tribal to get that experience and snake tribal is a tribe that is cool it plays a lot of high power stuff like you have coiling oracle you have uh the two mana snow ice fang quaddle that one like there's a whole bunch of interesting unique gameplay in a deck like that and it's in a format where only it can exist and in, in any other format, it would be way too overpowered, like in Standard, or it would be way too underpowered, like in Legacy and Vintage. And Modern is the like type of place that that can exist. And it won't exist in Pioneer, because nobody plays Pioneer. And Sorry. And, uh, and they're never going to reprint those cards into Pioneer. And it won't exist in his Historic, because they're already printing high-power cards from Modern Horizons into Historic. So, like... Rather than print a card that could support a narrow, interesting archetype like that, we get free Thoughtseize. We get free th free Swords to Plowshares. We get the best one drop in the game that's not type limited or color limited or any restrictions whatsoever. And I think more than the fact that these cards exist and now oppress interesting, like, fringe playable cards completely out of the metagame, we lose the opportunity to have unique narrow cards added to magic that would be interesting and fun to play against and interesting and fun to build around so that's my two cents i've given it repeatedly recently it's one of the reasons i've not been enjoying constructed modern as much um like i said the fact that this deck exists disgusts me uh it is good i highly recommend you play it francis boyes i'm sorry to have used your patreon video to uh <laughs> to, i don't know uh, as a soapbox to explain this. I think this is 
as much as I dislike it, I think it's a cool deck and, um, I'm sad that it exists, but thank you for showing this deck off to me. Thank you for getting me to play it. And thank you for being a jank. I think it's jank adept patron, the $35 tier. If you want to, uh, get me to play interesting decks that I don't normally play, you can try joining my Patreon. Link should be in the description below and there'll be a thank you, uh, with all of my patron names at the end of this video. And, uh, I really appreciate you all for watching your wonderful human beings. And uh, I hope to see you guys next time. Bye. Hey, just wanted to give a shout out to my patrons for the month of August. You guys are wonderful and I really appreciate your support. It's been helping me make a lot of good content. If you want your name to show up in this list, there's a link to my Patreon in the description down below if you want to support this channel. Thank you so much.